Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation's Lunch and Learn. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm super excited uh, with our speakers and our guests that we have here. I'm going to take a minute to introduce them and, and read from their bios. Uh, so first we have Margaret Brittingham. She is a professor of wildlife resources in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at Penn State University. She conducts research on forest songbirds, teaches ornithology, and is a wildlife extension specialist for Pennsylvania. Margaret also enjoys bird watching throughout the year and especially during migration. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Thank you Marcy. Yes. And um, I also like to welcome Keith Russell. He is the program manager for urban conservation for Audubon, Pennsylvania. He's based in Philadelphia. He works on a variety of bird conservation issues, including, including bird collisions with man-made structures, birds and nocturnal lights, non-native plants, and migration stopover habitat. He's also a research associate of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University and has received a number of awards, including the 2016 American Birding Association's Ludlow Griscom Award for Outstanding Contributions to Regional Ornithology. So welcome, Keith. Thanks. Thank you both so much for being here with me, and it's, it's great to see you again. Um, let's just dive right into this. Um, you both have a very long history and passion for bird watching, and in fact, you've both made it your career. So what attracted you to bird watching? Well, for me, I kind of came in a backdoor kind of a way, and I was older when I started bird watching. I was in college, I was pre-med, um, and I ended up taking a course in botany, a, a systematic botany class that was really uh, wildflowers, spring wildflowers. And I had always been interested in the outdoors, always been hiking, camping, things like that, but for some how had missed everything that was going on. And so spring wildflowers kind of just, I was just so impressed, you know, Trillium and Dutchman's Bridges and Hepatica. And then all of a sudden I realized just the joys of phenology and just what was happening that I'd been missing. And, um, Shortly after that, met a couple of people who were birders and, you know, sort of put birding and wildflowers together and actually took um, a Parks and Rec bird watching class and just was completely just loved it and decided to go back to school, went back and got a second degree in wildlife and went on from there. Amazing. So it's just by <laughs> chance. Yeah. Yes. How about you, Keith? Well, I think Margaret and I both are interested in birds for pretty similar reasons because birds are just so fantastic and um, they kind of draw you in. But the route that I got in was a little different from Margaret's because I don't really know. I was like in the second grade. I was really young. And um, I remember being in the third grade, giving a report to my class on birds. And that's the earliest memory I have, but I don't, it wasn't a parent. It wasn't a family member. It wasn't a teacher. It might've been a book. It might've been a TV show. I just don't have any remem remembrance now of what it was, but it's something I was interested in birds. So yeah. um, it just happened. Um, and I'm glad it did. <laughs> you know, you just never know what your destiny will be and where it will come from. But it's worked out so far. And Marcy, I, I want to say that, I, People who start as kids are so much better in terms of being bird. I mean, they're just wired differently. And well, <laughs> sorry, let me get this off. That's why they said out a bird brain. <laughs> yeah, um, you know that if it, it, it's amazing. Like I work really hard at it, but when I look at um, people who started when they were, you know, six or seven or something like that, they're they're wired differently. And my kids, because they grew up knowing it. It's just a different way. You're just so much more perceptive. But well, I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's important that you know everybody is um, aware that you don't have to be interested as a child, and people get involved with burning at all kinds of different yeah. ages. Right. Some people go through their whole lives and then they re they retire and then they yeah. really get into burning. Um, right. So it's welcoming to people at any age and at any point in their life it's a great thing to, to add to your life in any way you can. Well, I'd like to follow up on that question with, with, with you, Keith. Um, did you have a mentor? If you're in third grade and you don't have family that were, you said that you're, you didn't have a parent or a grandparent that was into bird watching, did you have a mentor or, or were you teaching yourself? 
Well, I did have mentors, a couple during, you know, the course of, of my early birding years. And the first one was a, a person in our neighborhood that my parents, they saw, oh, you're interested in birds and what are we going to do? They were supportive and they went and tried to find someone. And they asked some neighbors and found this guy that lived around the corner from us who happened to be a very well-known birder in Philadelphia. So I was calling him up and he eventually started taking me on trips and to New Jersey and other places I'd never been to. And it's really critical if you're going to be um, seriously interested in birds, I think to have some relationship with a experienced birder when you're young, it really helps a lot. Um, or when you're, you know, when you're first getting interested in birds to help have someone to help you guide you and, and show you the way. And then there were other people I met after that. I think all of us who are birders, um, eventually you can point to key people in your life that you've gotten to know that made a difference in your knowledge and your experience connecting you with other people. It's sort of like learning a language. It, it helps to be able to speak it with somebody. And I guess it sounds similar when you're learning to bird. It helps to to be able to share that experience and have somebody, you know, guide you in, in the, the vocalizations and the habitats, etc. Absolutely. And the thing that's so great about birding is there's so many places to find that. I mean, Pennsylvania in particular is just filled with people who are interested in birds and bird clubs and, you know, and so that you can, you know, anything from your neighbor to your local bird club, there are a lot of people around who want to share their knowledge and share their information and just love teaching you about it. Yeah, I, I really want to underscore what Margaret said. Pennsylvania is a special place for birding. And, um, you know, if you look at the number of Christmas bird counts that um, are done in Pennsylvania, um, for people that are familiar with the Christmas bird count, um, there are more done in Pennsylvania than any other state yeah. along the Atlantic Flyway. So, so can we you have a familiar? birding community. Can, can you define what a Christmas bird count is for those who are unfamiliar? That's good, yeah. A Christmas bird count is basically a, a winter bird census. And uh, Audubon, the Audubon Society coordinates these. Uh, they happen every year. They've been going on since the beginning of the 20th century. And now there are thousands done, you know, all over North America and outside of North America. It's a way of getting information about our, our winter bird populations. Uh, it's what I guess we call citizen science or community science, where any person that's uh, interested in birds can participate in one of these Christmas bird counts and um, go out and count birds in your area. And then that data is co collated by Audubon. And then we use that data to drive conservation. That gives us information about bird populations that's very important that we can't get any other way. And it helps us un to understand birds' uh, numbers, the birds that are rising or, or declining, and um, it's really invaluable information. So Christmas bird counts are done all over uh, and we have a lot of them here in Pennsylvania. And you can, as you were showing the, the, the website on National Audubon's website, there's information about the Christmas bird count. Excellent, and I saw 119, uh, it's 119th year. So that's a, that's a pretty long time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's our longest continuous bird survey that we've got, and it's used for looking at, you know, everything from invasion. So when house finches, you know, which were not historically here, came into the eastern United States and spread, Christmas bird count is just tracks it year by year. You can see that. And right now it's being used for looking at global climate change and how birds are extending their ranges northward. So used to answer all kinds of questions, but particularly these ones where you're getting sort of large scale shifts and movements of species. Yes. yes, excellent. Well, I want to go back to something that you had said, Margaret, and uh, you used a term that I'm not sure everybody would understand, and that is phenology. So oh, phenology. Yeah, so sort of the, well, the, the changes that occur with the seasons, I'm not sure exactly what the 
exact definition is, but it's basically as a se the seasonal changes and understanding those seasonal changes. And so that in the spring, you know, I was talking about spring wildflowers, but they come up at a certain time of year and then they're, then they're basically gone and, and we don't have until the next year. And with birds, of course, we've got the spring migrants that come in and those birds will, you know, arrive, starting to arrive in late February, March, April, May. And then we have our summer breeders and then fall where we are right now, we're back in migration again and the birds are leaving. And so it's those seasonal changes. And one of the things about being a birder is that you get the visualization of that. You know, we think of seasons as, okay, it's time to go back to school or, you know, summer vacation or whatever, but this is like, you can just see it and, you know, daily by what those changes are. And so it's, it's a really great way to connect with the natural world. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the other question I had was, you know, during COVID-19, the number of people enjoying watching birds has increased. Why do you think bird watching is accessible to so many people? And why do you think the numbers are, are increasing? Well, you can basically bird watch anywhere. I mean, you can walk out on a city street and you're going to see, you know, you're going to see maybe morning doves or house sparrows or you get to a little patch of green and have a great cat bird hidden in the shrubbery. So you can bird anywhere. That's one. And I think, but I think what happened with COVID was that people were suddenly restricted and had to look a little bit more closely. You know, you have to suddenly, suddenly you're spending time and you're looking like, wow, I didn't notice that was going on out around me. And people became much more aware of what was happening in their own backyard. Yeah. Yeah, it's really put people in touch with their families, their neighborhoods, um, their neighborhood, their, their neighbors, and their birds. And um, yeah. it's a good opportunity to to open your eyes to things that you haven't seen before. And um, you know, in addition to what Margaret said about birds being everywhere, which is really true, um, they are here all year round. They're fairly easy to observe. And you don't necessarily have to invest in a lot of equipment or travel or whatever to observe them. All you really need is your eyes and your ability to, to see. And uh, you know there are people who are shut in and they can look out their window and see birds at a bird feeder. Um, so birds are wonderful. Uh, they entertain us, you know, they intrigue us and they don't require us to invest in huge amounts of equipment to observe them. And this is no shade on other parts of the natural world, but you know, if you're interested in plants, um, there are barriers to get over to identify <laughs> some plants that don't exist. And if you're interested in insects, there are more barriers to get over. <laughs> and, you know, birds are the easiest and they're the most accessible. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They're visible, organisms they're, out there. They're visible, they're vocal, and they've got, you know, intriguing sort of relationships with each other. So you can look at, you know, maybe you'll see a male feeding a female or, or you'll see young suddenly coming to your bird bed. Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of, you can look at, or you can see, you know, disputes like the two hummingbirds fighting over trying to get to that on your hummingbird feeder so there's lots of intrigue and interest and and they're and they're visible and they're vocal and they're there during the day and and right you don't need to have a lot of equipment to see them yeah and i think that's important to emphasize because i, I think sometimes you see uh people that have invested many years in bird watching and they have large scopes and fancy binoculars and that can be intimidating to somebody that's thinking that they might like to do it um but doesn't have that those pieces of equipment. But if you have your eyes or your ears, because I have a good friend who's an, uh, she's very good at at the, at the songs. She doesn't uh -huh. really see very well, but she can she can identify birds and enjoys identifying them through their vocalizations. Yeah. Yeah. No, my mother's ninety three, and I would say she probably didn't get interested in birds till she became less mobile, <laughs> and now. She sit outside and and you know watch the birds coming into the feeder and and um, my sister gets mad about the squirrels coming over to take them but and my mother says she's you know doesn't care about the squirrel i mean she's likes the squirrel too <laughs> and that's you know she loves spending the day that way yeah 
Yeah. Something, you know, it, and it's interesting. Um, my mother is the same way. She's she now she has feeders. She, you know, that's what she wants for Christmas is bird food and, and more feeders so she can watch the birds. And I don't, I don't remember taking an interest in that when we were younger. Right. Now, 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 the two of you have very different focuses as it relates to, to bird watching. And Margaret, you're really forest interior birds. Keith, you know, reading your uh, your bio, you're more of the urban bird watcher and some of the hazards of that. So can you talk a little bit, each of you, about your focus as it relates to birds and, you know, kind of, a, you know, help us to understand what it is that you do and and maybe some of the, the Keith, you, you look a lot at some of the challenges that birds face. Maybe share with us some of the challenges that birds are facing. Well, there are challenges birds are facing, unfortunately, now everywhere. Um, whether it's in cities or it's in, you know, forests, uh, there are things that are going on rapidly that are changing um, all the places that birds use. And even the birds that use forests, uh, where there may be a relatively, you know, rel they're smaller numbers of threats, but they're, they're, they can be significant. A lot of those are migratory. So they're actually moving around and at a particular season, then they'll travel through other areas where there are cities and they face all kinds of threats there. So um, in urban areas or where, where people live, there are threats from glass windows and other uh, man-made uh, structures that have glass in them. Birds don't, most birds don't know what glass is. And when they encounter it for the first time, they often are fooled by reflections in the glass or by the transparency of glass and they fly right into it. And um, so that's responsible for anywhere from 365 million to a billion collisions um, in the United States. That's just the US and they're happening in Canada and all over the world. So it takes a huge toll. A lot of these birds, um, most of the birds that fly into the glass die. And um, so it's it's killing huge numbers of birds. And birds can also have collisions with planes and with motor vehicles, with wind turbines. So we've got all these obstacles for them. Um, and I'm kind of concerned about drones. Uh, as people start using more and more drones, we've seen evidence that, you know, raptors in particular are attacking them and getting their feet cut off and drones can be potentially a real problem for birds yeah uh, and then there's there's many other things um i'm sure margaret will cover a lot of these but you know there's herbicides and pesticides that people use especially in uh, around their homes that can be a problem and um there are diseases that are really big and here in Pennsylvania, West Nile virus has really done a number on many species of birds and people don't talk about it, but it's reduced the populations of a lot of common birds um, significantly in certain parts of the state. Uh, so that's something that's still happening. Salmonella is something that can be spread in birds and even at a bird feeder. So um, there are so many threats the birds face um, just like people face a lot of threats, birds face a lot of threats, and yeah. um, you know, there's non-native plants. I, 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 there's there's other things. Margaret will yeah. sure, <laughs> can talk about the non-native plants and um, and th you know things like that that are more threatening to birds in forest set settings. Well, as Keith said, there there are lots of different issues, and there was actually a big study that came out this year, which a lot of people saw, which was the three billion birds gone, and really looking at bird decline since 1970, and and really, as Keith said, across the across a range of habitat types, they're not restricted to one. Um, I've been involved with birds in in sort of different ways. One on a research side, so trying to understand um, how changes human-induced changes affects birds and how birds respond to them. Um, and so recently looking at forest habitat, have things like shale gas development, how birds respond to that, um, habitat fragmentation overall. So as we um, build within forests, build suburban developments, how do these migrant songbirds respond? Um, so 
And there, there are lots of different issues um, depending on where you are, but kind of the big thing that we're trying to get at now is, is just looking at this whole, the whole picture. So both, you know, where they are during the breeding season, which oh, now, you know, they require large blocks of extensive forest and Pennsylvania is, a, you know, a key state in that. That's one of the, you know, it's one of the wonderful things about Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the things that the, Pennsylvania Game Commission did was start looking at what they called responsibility species. So not just focusing on species that are in trouble, but focusing on species who we have a responsibility for. Interesting. Yeah. Like scarlet tanager, I think it's 15% of the global population breeds in Pennsylvania. Um, with thrush, it's 8% of the global population. And so because we do have these wonderful forests, these big extensive forests, we're kind of the, you know, the core area for many of these species. And so, um, so what I'm interested in is how do we maintain that? And that doesn't mean hands off, nothing can happen because you can't really exist that way. But it's how do you do any of these processes, whether it's, you know, timber management or shale gas development or anything else, you know, how do we do it in a way that protects uh, the value of those habitats? And I think um, another thing, this is just looking forward in the future, but I think overall we've got to start um, figuring out a way to value, to place a value on that that we haven't really figured out how to do yet. So when people look, we always kind of think economic value but we're forgetting that all of our development and all that depends on healthy ecosystems. And these birds are such a super important part of that, a super important part of keeping our forests healthy and all of that. So that's kind of a roundabout way. I don't think I answered your question, but. Yeah, and and, and uh, do you find that, you know, like in Pennsylvania, we have the Environmental Rights Amendment. Does, is that helpful at all as, as you're talking about bird protection and as because would that be not part of the natural and, and cultural beauty of, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? And that is the, those birds that we call ours, even if it's temporary, you know, for a breeding season. Um, yeah, no, I think that's very helpful. But I think we have to continue on with it, you know, because I think sometimes even when we talk about, like, take forest management, we sort of talk about, well, timber's the driver, but if I can afford it, maybe I'll think about birds, something like that, whereas really birds are what's keeping my forest healthy. I can't afford not to. And um, there's been some real interesting research that's been done by some Chris Whalen and other people out in the Midwest looking at, you know, where they would actually um, put netting over trees to keep birds out and really showing like now that oak is not growing nearly as well you know, once those birds have been excluded. So it's it's actually showing, you know, that they're contributing a huge amount, particularly in terms of insect control and things like that. And so I think we just have to keep kind of thinking of creative ways of doing that. I think with global climate change, obviously trees are, you know, are, are playing gonna play a huge, or are playing a huge role in that. And, but making people realize it, um, not just like I'm doing a good thing for it, but that we need this. Yeah, we do need it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we've we've talked about, you know, birds being the canary in the coal mine, you know, and I don't think that has changed. They, they still are a harbinger of, of how well, how healthy our ecosystem is. And we all depend on a healthy ecosystem. Right. So, yeah. Um, I find that that migration is possibly one of the most fascinating phenomenons in both the human created and the natural world. You know, I, you know, I, I was just reading about hummingbirds and, and um, cause we've, we've been watching them, you know, fight at the feeder <laughs> and the males left. And now, you know, we're starting to see the females and the juveniles going, but let's talk a little bit about migration. I mean, there are some pretty dynamic species that, that breed in Pennsylvania that go far away and, you know, the rest of the year. So do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? And I'll let you run with it however you like. But Well, the ruby-throated hummingbird is our hummingbird that breeds in Pennsylvania. We only have one species here. And uh, as you said, they're 
they're coming to bird feeders and right now they're they're still at bird feeders but in another uh, couple of weeks we'll see you know relatively few of them and usually they're gone by the end of october and they're going to migrate down to the neotropics so they'll leave the united states and go down through uh, central america to their breeding grounds and i mean their wintering grounds and what a lot of people would probably find pretty amazing is that they migrate across the Gulf of Mexico. So they'll cross huge expanses of water in a single flight, obviously without stopping. And, you know, this tiny bird the size of a big, you know, jelly bean or, I don't know, a small candy bar. <laughs> um, they fly across the Gulf of Mexico. They, they do incredible things and they do them twice a year, you know, just to get back and forth to where they're going to spend the winter and the summer. So these little birds that we've seen, um, you have to have a lot of respect for them and a lot of appreciation for all the good things they do to maintain a healthy environment. So that's just one example of one of our state's birds that's migratory and, you know, the incredible things they do. And there are other species that come through the state of Pennsylvania that don't really um, happen to be breeders in the state. Um, a bird like the black pole warbler, although there, there's a, a tiny number that may breed in the state, but they um, travel all the way down to Brazil, South America, and they also travel over water. So they travel over huge expanses of water over the Atlantic Ocean. Some of them probably depart from New England right. and they go down through the West Indies. I can't even imagine beginning a journey like that, you know, and you just got to fly until you get to land. So, and a lot of them breed up in, um, there's a black pole warbler. A lot of them breed up in um, Northern Canada and West to Alaska. So they're traveling. I don't know how many miles it is round trip each year, but this little bird, you know, that's like four and a half inches long, um, they've got to do this in order to get from where they breed to where they winter. And they come through Pennsylvania in large numbers. So um, these are just two examples of what's happening um, in terms of migration. Yeah. With black hole warblers, as you said, they fly across the Atlantic, or they start, they go to the coast, and then they fly down over the Atlantic Ocean and then hit land, you know, at the northern edge of South America. And it's the equivalent, they say, of a person running a four minute mile for 72 hours straight. <laughs> so try that. Um, I don't even want to run for an hour. <laughs> yeah. And they um, they double the weight before they take off. So they actually they go through something called hyperphagia, which means hyper, you know, eating a lot. And so they'll just feed really heavily before they take off and then, you know, survive on that fat as they go across. But um Migration has intrigued people for forever. You know, the first the you know the comings and goings of birds, but then you know how do they find their way and and how do they make it physically and and um, what's happening now is that songbirds, which are migrating, a lot of them are migrating right now, will fly at night, and so they fly at night. And then when it gets to be dawn, they kind of look around, where am I? Where can I go down? And that's where they're looking for those patches of habitat that could be your backyard. Often in places like cemeteries or a nice green space in a city, um, but parks. And then they go down and then they've got to feed and re replenish and refuel before they can go on the next day. Sometimes they'll stay a couple of days, depending on what the weather's like. Um, but the, they're really, you know, it's like they're flying all night long. And there's this really neat website called BirdCast, which takes weather data because weather radar data um, has always picked up birds, but they the, the meteorologists filter out the birds so they can see what the weather patterns are. But the ornithologists filter out the weather so they can see where the birds are. <laughs> <laughs> and BirdCast allows you to look at real time. Um, yeah, if you go back to the bottom of this, you can see a real time graph. Keep and if you go, and then if you 
hit the clip on that one that says live, it would go up a little bit, go live, and you can see it. It'll show you what happened last night. You can see the movement of the birds, and the brighter the color is, the more there were. Um, so, wow. yeah, so hit the go button, hit the, the arrow, just make it start. And you can see the red line of sunset. Look at the Pennsylvania lit up last night. Look wow. at that. Yeah, so I love this thing. Yeah, so it's just like, oh my gosh, you gotta get outside. <laughs> so that's that was last night. So it's pretty interesting. We, yeah, we oh, we were um, we were supposed to have, you know, I think Texas and Pennsylvania were two of the hottest spots in North America, well, in the United States last night for bird migration. And so there were supposed to be huge numbers, as Margaret said, coming through our state and, you know, we get hundreds of millions of birds mm -hmm. probably passing through Pennsylvania uh, each year. We're a crucial um, spot along what's called the Atlantic Flyway, which is um, birds migrate everywhere, but there are certain regions of North America where they're concentrating in higher numbers and up and down the Atlantic coast is one of those and we call that the Atlantic Flyway, and we sort of identify four regions that are key flyways. So Pennsylvania is on that flyway, and um, we're getting birds coming and going, you know, in the spring and the fall that are going up to Canada, Alaska, all kinds of places, but they funnel through Pennsylvania, and then they sort of spread out as they get further north. And as they're coming south, they're coming south through Pennsylvania. A lot of them are going southwest, so they can go down to Texas and through or across the Gulf of Mexico. Some of them will come actually southeast and go into the West Indies. So we're a major route for bird migration. And um, like Margaret said, these a lot of our songbirds are migrating at night, but not all bird species migrate at night. Um, there are some that migrate during the day. Uh, and there are um, raptors, a lot of raptors, migrate during the day and we have in our state a lot of very well-known, nationally well-known places for you to watch uh, those hawks migrate. Hawk Mountain is an iconic place here in Pennsylvania uh, along the Kittatinny Ridge, uh, Berks County. People can go and um, they can watch these uh, hawks migrating uh, during the day. But at night, you really can't um, see them uh, very easily. So um, you just have to know they're there, but you can hear them a lot of times. Uh, they give little calls as they're migrating at night. And if you listen on a, a heavy migration night, you can hear quite a lot of them. I'll have to keep my eye on the bird cast because would, that would be a fun thing to do. But you, you yeah. both touched on something in that is that, you know, we're fortunate in Pennsylvania that we have recovered from being totally denuded of trees, you know, a hundred years ago, a little over that to, to being very heavily forested, 17 million acres of forest, um, only a little over three of it. Well, what is it? A little more than that. DCNR has 2.5 million acres of that, you know, the game land owns, but a lot of it's privately owned forest. So not just from a forest habitat, but from anybody who ha owns property, what is it that people can do at home so that when birds are passing through or just or to create habitat for backyard birds, um, what can people do on, on, on their properties to, to help bird survive and to create critical, helpful bird habitat? One of the, the best things you can do in your backyard is really um, maintaining or plant or replanting native plants. So in the past, kind of when we thought about landscaped areas, a lot of times we've used plants that were not native to this area that maybe came from Europe or other countries. And there's been some really um, interesting work done by Doug Tallamy at um, University of Delaware where they basically looked at insects and insects are really the food that many of these birds are eating and the majority of what they're eating during the breeding season. And what he found was that these non-native plants were not supporting the, in the native insect pop populations. And so that kind of came into the forefront recently just because of the whole pollinator crisis. Mm -hmm. So affects 
um, birds because, of course, you've got the birds are needing to be feeding on those insects. And so one of the best things you can do is plant native plants in your yard um, and really try to think ecologically. So think what would be here naturally um, and use some of those trees and shrubs. And, and um, we've got on our extension website, um, which Pam has got up here, um, we've got a, a number of different publications that talk about examples of trees and shrubs, but it's really, um, you know, for shade trees would be things like the oaks and the maples, and then for the mid-sized things like serviceberry and dogwood and and viburnums for the shrub layer. But really, just trying to to um, instead of making our look different from nature, try to look like what what the natural habitat is, and trying to sort of replace that in your yard or maintain that in your yard. We have a problem with invasive plants. Some, and those are often non-native plants, but the ones that are very aggressive, they do really well. So things like honeysuckle is one, multiflora rose is another, um, olive is another, stilt, Japanese stilt grass um, for the herbaceous ones. Some of them we intentionally planted by mistake, intentionally by mistake. We, we intentionally planted at one point and now realize our mistake. Others like Japanese silkgrass came in, you know, unintentionally, but these are plants that are not native, but they take over areas and then they make it harder for native plants to grow. And so managing those is another issue. Yeah. And the, um, the spotted lanternfly is an example of an invasive species. It doesn't have to just be a plant. It's something that is alien to our state or North America that comes from another part of the world and happens to do really well, yeah. like a, a Norway rat or <laughs> house smells. <laughs> so these are the Norway rats of the plant world. They just invade, they take over and they cause a lot of problems and they displace native species of plants. So um, as Margaret said, you know, our native species of plants are um, really important for birds that's where a lot of our native um, butterflies and moths lay their eggs. They can't lay their eggs on species of other plants. And, um, you know, they, they have to reproduce here. And one of the reasons the spotted lanternfly is, is doing well is because it's from Asia and it really likes to feed on Asian trees, like the tree of heaven, which is an invasive species here. And they're all over. And so they, the spotted lanternflies get here and they say, oh, look, there's our home trees from our home country. And they, they're they specialized to feed on those trees, although they can feed on other types of plants too. So that helps them to really take off. And it's become like one of the plagues of Egypt. <laughs> I mean, here in Philadelphia, there's just millions of them. And it's, you see places where there's piles of them all over the street and all over trees and people are just, everyone's just amazed. You just can't believe it. Yeah, I've seen trees but, that look like they're alive because there's so many lanternflies. Yeah. Are they finding that there are any birds that will, will eat them? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> We've got a few examples of birds, like red-bellied woodpecker and, um, you know, they'll pull off the wings to eat them. But there's some neat research that's... Um, starting up at Penn State, looking at whether spotted lanternflies are bad tasting, which people think they are because they're getting the toxins from the tree of heaven. Um, so what that one question is whether what they fed on when they were being, being growing up, whether that makes them bad tasting or not. And then if they're, if they're not bad tasting, whether birds can learn that that's a prey item and that they'll maybe someday have some kind of control. Yeah, because right now there's not much control. No. And again, it's an example of you don't have native predators. One of the things that this whole sort of far ranging conversation that I wanted to bring back was we're talking about birds, but in the process of that, you know, it's, it's plants, it's insects, it's the health of the environment, that all of these things are important. So it's not just like, I'm interested in birds, so let's talk about Birds, but realizing that birds are a way to really visually see all of these other issues that are occurring. But really, it's that we've got to have the native, you know, we've got to worry about the plant, plant populations, the insect populations, the whole way, the whole way up. Yeah, it really is the web of life, the interconnected. Yeah. 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 
When I was in college, I took an entomology course, and I'm so glad I did, but yeah. I did not take a botany course, and well, I wish I had, Margaret, because yeah. <laughs> I'm catching up, but it's really yeah. very helpful uh -huh. to understand the web of life, as Marcy just said, and how all these things need each other and um, can't have one without the other, so. You know, yeah, and so you've got to kind of think that way, and I think um, birders intuitively gain that just because you start realizing once the more interested you get in birds, then you start to look for them, and then you find out, well, certain ones are only in wetland habitats. Certain ones require, if I'm going to look for a bobolink, I'm going to have to find a big, you know, open hay field or, you know, grassland field. Um, so you start to intuitively realize those things about how we've got to have, you know, this diversity of places and habitats and, and healthy environments. Yeah. I, and I just want to go back and, and just talk about something Margaret brought up um, in terms of insects and plants. And, you know, for, for years when, when I was, you know, younger birding, you know, we, we kind of figured out that if you want to find warblers and other songbirds in the spring during the time that they're migrating, you find an oak tree, a native oak tree. And they're just, they're all over the oak trees feeding. And for years, it's like, why is that? <laughs> you know, most of these warblers and, and other songbirds, vireos and grosbeaks and tanagers, they're in oak trees. They're not in a lot of these other native trees, but mainly oak trees. And uh, and then Doug Tallamy, you know, was doing his research and published his book and he explained it all. And it's because oak trees of all the native trees in Pennsylvania are the places where more species of butterflies and moths lay their eggs. They have specific oh. trees that they lay their eggs on that they can eat without being um, harmed by the toxins. So they can detoxify the toxins that are in oak trees, but not necessarily in ash trees or maple trees or other species. So there are more species of butterflies and moths that lay their eggs on oak trees and any, there's like, I don't know, hundreds, there are like six or 700. And so that's where all the caterpillars are. And um, so that's why all these warblers are feeding in these oak trees in the spring because that's where all the caterpillars are. And uh, for years, it was like a mystery. And then Doug published his research and yeah. we all yeah, connected the dots. Yeah, there's, um, that he's got a thing on his website, a, a link that you can get to where you can look and see which, like, which caterpillars are, are associated with which plant species. But, um, but he talks about species being keystone species, and an oak would be a keystone species. So it doesn't mean that you don't want anything else, but you need to have some of these keystone species because those are the big supporters. In the herbaceous world, goldenrod ends up being the, what, the keystone species. It's Sorry. unfortunate for goldenrod, that, though, because people mistakenly think it's the cause of their, their allergies or their yeah. hay fever, but it's not. It gets a bad name. It's actually, as you say, a very beneficial plant. Right. Right. He's he's funny, too, in his books. He talks about, you know, plants getting bad reputations like that, also being named wrong, like butterfly weed. He says then people call it a weed, so everybody wants to pull it out, but really it's, you know, so now he's calling it monarch delight. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. You know, you, you mentioned the ash tree, and, you know, I don't know where that falls in terms of, of keystone species for birds, but, you know, we're, we're, we're set to lose... 99 percent of our ash trees to the emerald ash borer you know do you either of you see this as having a a, a heavy impact on on our bird populations is it a, is it a species of tree that is specific to any particular birds it's not it's not one where you have a super tight relationship but certainly all of these changes that have occurred are having sort of cumulative effects I mean, emerald ash borer, I didn't even realize how many ashes we had till all of a sudden they started dying. And then you can sort of like, wow, there are a lot of ashes around yeah, here. There are a and, lot. You know, the initial change has been the woodpecker populations have gone up in a lot of those areas. And woodpeckers have actually helped to maintain the ash till, till the point where they get, you know, it's out of their control. But, um, but we're losing the ash. Um, 
you know, another one sort of in that that group is um, hemlock woolly adelgid getting the hemp. Mm -hmm. So we've got sort of different ones. And with hemlock, you've got a closer connections between birds being, you know, really closely tied to hemlock. But with all of these, it's having a cumulative, you know, a cumulative effect. You lose all these patches of them and you end up with, you know, more homogeneous stands of maybe red maple or something like that. Um, so, so, yeah, it's having a cumulative effect. I mean, you think about what our forests were originally. I mean, it's hard for us to even imagine because, of course, the chestnut was king and the passenger pigeon was the, you know, was was the most abundant bird ever on earth and was filling, you know, filling our Pennsylvania forests. So, so we've had a ton of changes already, but yes, those are all going to, going to chip away at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like having an investment portfolio when it's diversified and you have a lot of different things, it's resilient, but yeah. when it's not diversified and you only have a couple, you could go down. So yeah. this is what's happening environmentally as we lose these different species of trees and, and other types of plants, the, the forest and, and everything that depends on them becomes more fragile. So. Yeah, and I think, I think going back to your question about whether you're a homeowner or a forest landowner or whatever else, it's, it's diversifying, it's keeping, you know, it's not doing single species management. It's trying to, because you know, it was gypsy moth coming in and hitting the oaks. I mean, it's certainly these pests are much, better able to spread where you've got high numbers of one species. And so kind of trying to keep that diversity is, is super important. Yeah. And we, we see like with the ash, we're seeing it in some communities because it was a, it was a suburban tree that people were yeah. planting or a street tree. And, yeah, and street tree. If, if the whole community was ash, you've, you've lost all your, your canopy. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's good. I, I like the, the, uh, the portfolio. Yeah. Approach. <laughs> Can resonate with people. Um, we're, we're starting to run out of time, so I just wanted to um, ask each of you: What was the most unusual or exciting bird you have you have seen during your your bird watching uh, times? Well, I you know sometimes you can think of things that are rare that you've seen that were exciting, but uh, or things in unusual places or at usual times. But I guess for me. Um, I think it was the first time I saw certain birds, you know, when I was younger and growing up and I had read about them in books and been expecting or wanting to see them. And then there they are. <laughs> and um, I remember the first time I saw a pileated woodpecker, which is our largest woodpecker in East, East well, in North America, assuming there's no more ivy bill woodpeckers. Um, yes. You know, it was at our house in Philadelphia and there was this big silver maple that was there. And one day I went out and I looked up and there was a pileated woodpecker. I didn't have my binoculars. It was just so big it was there. My head practically exploded. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> like a woolly mammoth showed up or something. So it was a real great memory. And at that point, pileated woodpeckers were pretty rare in Philadelphia. They've become pretty established now, but, um, at that point, there were very few of them around, so it was really unusual seeing them. And I remember, um, there it is. Yeah, it's a beautiful bird. And even today, when whenever you see it, you just look at it and you're just fascinated at you know, the, the size of the bird, the color of the bird, the behavior. It's just such a magnificent creature. It is. It, it's just a huge woodpecker. Um, I remember the first time I saw a bay-breasted warbler. And that's a bird that migrates through Pennsylvania and doesn't stay here in the winter or in the summer, They're just here. And there's not many of them. And I don't know why, but it was just one of those special birds you were looking for that wasn't common and you hadn't seen yet. And there was one at eye level in a place called Carpenter's Woods in Philadelphia. And it's like, ah! <laughs> it was so beautiful. Yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, just saw one of those yesterday, too, migrating. <laughs> Yeah. And they look very different now that they're coming through in the fall. They lose all their color and they become mm -hmm. sort of uh, greenish and olive and gray. But this is what they look like in the spring. This is a male, at least. And the females are sort of similar, but not as bright. So that bird just left an impression on me when I first saw it. I guess I was really trying to find one. And then I finally did. It was 
and write at eye level. Yeah, because yeah. usually yeah, that's pretty astounding. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Margaret? What's your memorable? You know, mine. Um, I, I think it's it is very time and place dependent, but mine was what really got me going on bird watching, and I think what I'd call my spark bird. So again, I was in college. I was kind of you know trying to figure out what I was going to do and where I was going to go and all those kind of things. And I'd taken that botany course, and I had um, a bird feeder outside my apartment window, and a fl a northern flicker came to the window. And back then called yellow shafted flicker, but a northern flicker, so another woodpecker. And it was like the craziest looking bird I had ever seen with those polka dots on the back and, uh, you know, the red and the black and the mustache lines coming down. And I was just like, wow. And it was really just, you know, and it's a super common bird. But anyway, it was something that just, you know, I looked at it and I was just like, wow. And then I got, you know, that sort of got me, um, you know, the just with the polka dots and the, you know, I was like, who dressed well, this? I, don't know. <laughs> I, took it as a, I need to, you know, start thinking of other things. So, so that was, that was my first one. I call that my spark bird. And then, um, you were talking about barred owls. And so January 1st of 2019, Every year, if you're a birder, usually the first thing you do is on January 1st is you start your year list. And so you walk outside and you're like, what's going to be my first bird? And, and I was thinking, it's probably going to be a black-capped chickadee. And it just as I was standing there, this barn owl just dropped down out of space and landed on the fence post right in front of me. Mm. And Yeah, just like that on that fence post there. <laughs> and it was just right there. And uh, that was my first bird of 2019. And uh, it was just super exciting at the, <laughs> to see it there then. And was it a good year? Because I would take it was that. A good year. It was a good year. Great year. Good year. Good year for bird watching. Well, you know, it, it, as we're starting to wrap up, would you, what piece of advice would you offer to somebody that's, that's um, just getting into bird watching? If you could each, each offer one, one or two tips for somebody. Well, there's a lot of things I guess you could say, but um, one thing that I would, I would personally, I would say, if if you're going to get into birding and this is fairly new to you and you haven't sort of picked a field guide or whatever to use, having a field guide is like your Bible. It's really important to learn, you know, all the field marks of all the birds. And I personally find that field guides that are created with illustrations, um, paintings and drawings are a little bit, I think, more diagrammatic and make it simpler to understand what the field marks are that you're looking for. There are field guides that are illustrated with photos of birds instead of drawings. So they're not diagrams, they're just photos. And they're very helpful, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's good to maybe have both but don't neglect the field guides the older fashioned field guides that have drawings and paintings because what you're doing there is sort of what they're, they're sort of representing birds sort of like an architect's drawing of a building it's a diagram it shows you exactly where to get in where exactly how big it is exactly where the windows are and you know it's very clear with photos it's not quite as clear what it is that you're supposed to be looking for to identify that bird. But with a diagram, they've made it very clear for you. So um, I think sometimes when people are new, they see these flashy field guides with all these photos and it seems like this is the thing to do. It's the latest, greatest, this is the way we should go. And um, don't forget the drawings. They're they're actually more helpful. <laughs> I mean, all my, at least for me, they were. <laughs> I think they probably still are for most people. Yeah, I agree. Um, my advice would be to start where you are, like start right outside your door and start keeping a list. So, you know, go outside today. You'll probably will be able to see, you know, blue jay, a car, northern cardinal, a morning dove, and, and actually be surprised at how you start to learn. And then pay attention to learning your neighbors, you know, and learning what an American robin looks like. I mean, American robin actually has a lot of different looks and a lot of different um, songs, and people are always comparing it 
just like a robin, about the size of a robin. So anyway, so get to know those <laughs> familiar ones because that's what everybody bases everything else off of. And I um, had an interesting time. I got to go out with um, Richard Crosley, who does one of the, actually he does one of those, that mixed field guy with lots of different pictures. But, um, but his approach was, you don't want to be reading your field guide in the field. You know, you look at your field guide before you go out, but then when you go out in the field, really look and watch and study these birds and look at what they're they're looking like and get to know them as your friends. And I think that's actually what's, again, what's happening in code is people are spending a lot more time doing that. But so that he said, when you see your friend walking down the street, you're not saying she's got blue eyes or she's got brown hair and she's got, you know, a red, you know, you look at the sort of the, the overall, the profile, how they walk, how they talk and kind of get to know. So if you get to know Robin, Cardinal, Blue Jay, you know, just your neighbors, then you can really build on that and know when something new comes in. Yeah, you make a good point because, you know, sometimes the distinction is it bobs its tail a lot. But yeah. if, you, if you've not paid attention to its, its yeah. behavior, you wouldn't get to narrow it down. We're pretty excited this year. We have a thrasher in the backyard. Oh, I, yeah. Those are great yeah. birds to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it was like I was trying to get someone to tell me. He was a really good birder, and I was like, how do you know that's a Savannah Sparrow? And he looks at me and he goes like, well, what else would it be? <laughs> <laughs> I could give you about four things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always like to, you know, when people ask about identifying birds, um, I always like to sort of give them an example like, well, you know, have you heard a, let's say a Stevie Wonder song, I mean, you, or I don't know, popular person today, Adele or something. Uh, you know, most people who are not birders, they say, oh, that's Adele. Yeah. And I say, well, how do you know? Right. <laughs> and, you know, well, it's the same with birding. You you get to know not just what she sounds like, but what types of songs she sings and where she shows up and what she looks like. And it's all those things that go into making Adele Adele. And as Margaret was just, and you, you know, you guys were just saying, it. it it's a lot of different things about yeah. bird behavior and so on to go into it. So it kind of demystifies it. It's not like you have to have a special brain or right. go to a special school. We all have the ability to distinguish based on, you know, little clues. If your mother calls you on the phone and you don't see her, you know, it's your mother. Yeah. Right. So you, you <laughs> learn. So you can use those skills with birding and be, Every, all of us can be, you know, adept at identifying these birds too. Yeah, and, and I, I believe that, you know, the bird watching community is a very welcoming community so that if you're out and you have a question, you can approach a bird watcher and say, what are you looking at? How do you know? And they will share that information with you. Unlike if you yeah. see a fisherman with a string of fish and you say, where did you catch that? <laughs> and I'll stare in that hole. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I don't know. I have a, a feeling about birding and, and birders that is very, you know, like positive because I just think that birding generally, I know there are issues, but I think that in, in general birding for me at least has been a very welcoming community. And there's just something about birds. Uh, maybe it's because they're creatures, you know, God made these creatures. We didn't make them and we're just, admiring them, it's not us ourselves that we're looking at, you know, our songs or our sports or whatever we've done. We're looking at something outside of ourselves and we're just sort of emptying ourselves and, and letting the beauty of these things come in. It, it kind of takes our attention away from us and puts it on other things. And I just find that the people that are interested in birding tend to focus on the birds and, and not on differences in, our, in us as people and it brings people together. Um, I've always just been just sort of amazed at the community of birders. Yeah. There are people who are millionaires, there are people yeah. who have no money, there are people from different political you know, views mm -hmm. and they leave all of that on the outside. They put that away so that they can enjoy the birds together and it just brings so many different types of people together. Um, I'm sure that happens in other areas of life, but I think birding is one of the best areas um, for this. So 
And I know that there are problems. There are problems of access. There's, there's other things that can happen around the country in different places. But I think that for the most part, people who are serious birders tend to sort of leave their personal issues out of it. And they just want to come together based on these incredible creatures. And so that, I think birding is pretty special. I agree. I do, and I think Pennsylvania is a super special place to do it. I mean, you know, you mentioned Hawk Mountain, but there are just, there are lots of public places. There are lots of um, Mill Creek. There are all kinds of places where you can go and just see incredible numbers of birds. And there are bird clubs throughout this entire state and yeah. places where you can meet people and get involved. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 21 state parks, 2.2 million acres of state forest, 6,000 community parks, <laughs> game lands, fish and boat yeah. lands. So a lot of public lands. And then, you know, as you said, your own backyard. Yeah. Yeah. That what Marcus said is so true. You can, you can always start where you are and just, you know, open your eyes to what's there. And most people will be surprised um, once they start looking and trying to identify things. They, surprised at how many different species are right there where they are. And one thing that, that, that I, I feel fairly strongly about is you don't need to identify it to enjoy it. That's true. You can just yeah. take it in and enjoy the song, enjoy the beauty, enjoy the antiques. If you're watching a mating ritual, you know, there's, there's so much that you can enjoy about, about the bird, you, you know, even if you never identify what it is. Even pigeons and starlings, you know, are kind of fascinating if you start looking at them and watching them and seeing what they do and how they do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Well, starlings, those incredible huge flights that they have where you're like, how did you all decide to turn left at this? <laughs> <laughs> I love to watch that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we are running out of time. There are so many more things that we could talk about. I'm, 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 I wish that we had more time. Maybe you'll join me again and we can explore some, some more topics as it relates to birds down the road. But I wanted to thank you. I, I didn't see any, any questions pop up. Uh, I'll just open it up if um, anybody that's viewing had a question. But I... I Wanted to, to thank both of you very much for spending this this hour with me. And this will be available on our uh, Facebook page and our YouTube channel for, for perpetuity. That if you uh, people want to see it again or share it with a friend and you've shared some wonderful information with us and, and thank you for being here. So I'm going to end the broadcast, but if you two could stay with me, I'd be appreciative and Pam will join us as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you.